of doing church online is that we can have the blessing of uh, having you speak for us this morning. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Selvi. I'll get out of the way and then I'll come back uh, at the end. So thank you mm -hmm. very much for this morning. Thank you. Um, I'll just pray and then we'll get into the word of the Lord. Dear Father, I thank you so much that you are the God of truth and that we can wholly rely upon you. We can throw our whole life um, upon you and know that you are sufficient for everything that we encounter in life. Lord, that you are our strength, you are our rock, and you are the one who leads us through this um, desolate land. Lord, no matter where we live in this world, we need just know that the God of this world is your enemy. And Lord, we are in alien, hostile territory. And so, Lord, um, as especially looking at New Zealand, it can be deceiving looking at all this greenery and evidence of your hand. But Lord, um, I just thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your word, you've given us your spirit, and you've given us the body of Christ to remind us and to reorient our thinking and our eyesight to place our eyes squarely upon you and the things above. And so, Lord, as we come to this really important part of your of scripture that tells us about the, the whole crux of who are your chosen ones and who are not, Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding by your spirit. And Lord, may this understanding also open up um, other parts of scripture to us, that it may be ever more fruitful and increase our understanding so that we may relate to you, know you and obey you in even deeper, more meaningful and more intimate ways. And we pray this in the name of your son, our Messiah, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so as was said, my name is Salvador. I was in South Africa as a missionary from first in 2002 to um, the end of 2004, and then back in April 2006. My wife came over from New Zealand to South Africa in 2007. At the end of that year, we were married, and um, we served together till the beginning of 2018. Um, while I've been here in New Zealand, I'm part of a local fellowship in Bulls. We, we fellowship there, and we also um, have been working as a um, fence maker, and then I did a year contract teaching English, and this week I just started work in a meat processing plant, um, ripping off fat off... Um, what's called an omasum, which is one of the four bellies of a, or four stomachs, sorry, of a cow. And um, so it's quite interesting. We were going to travel and visit a few different countries, but with the whole COVID-19 lockdown, that's now been put on hold. But the Lord is so gracious to us. My wife had um, cancer um, just over a year ago, and um, she went through chemo. And um, she's made a really strong recovery, and um, the Lord's been so gracious to us. We, he's blessed us um, so abundantly. We are just absolutely, um, when we think about it, we're actually blown away. So today I want to look at Romans 9. Um, we've been tying in with um, Lionel's Wednesday night Bible study. And um, last week, Simon did a really good job at leading that. Um, we've been really enjoying that. Um, understandably, at this time, Lionel couldn't be there. And um, we've prayed for your mum, not for your mum, for you, Lionel. And um, we were praying for your mum before she passed away. Um, and we um looking forward to fellowshipping with you again, Lionel. So we've been going through Galatians as a group and um, trying to summarize the different parts of it. So I thought Romans 9 would be a good complement because it looks at the same truth, but from a different perspective. Um, from Galatians, it's from a Gentile perspective. Paul's writing to Gentiles who are looking to get being circumcised as a way of maybe overcoming the flesh, um, uh, of dealing with the problems that they were facing, and they were um, deceived into thinking that Torah observance was a necessary part of the Christian walk. And so Paul writes in very strong terms concerning them because of the deception. Romans 9, however, is looking at the perspective of 
the Jews. If you looked at Romans 9, you'll see that um, in chapter 9, verse 24, it's the first time he brings us Gentiles in. Um, before that, you're dealing with an exclusively Jewish context. And why is that important to recognize? We need to read Romans in its own life situation. We live in a, um, a Christian world or a world that has lots of churches in it that are predominantly Gentile. But at this time, Christianity was actually a sect or considered to be a sect within Judaism, which uncircumcised Gentiles were allowed to become part of it. So it was the other way around. And so we kind of have this mindset that we think, well, obviously Jews, when they became Christians, they stopped being Jews, they stopped living as Jews, they, they, they left those things behind, and it's just not true. They still lived as Jews, but their Judaism, their Jewish practices, their culture did not save them or make them righteous before God. And that's what the truth of the gospel um, was addressing, not just in the book of Acts, but also in the book of Romans. And so, you know, it's interesting we had um, Acts 26 read, and that really is a series of is part of a series of events that start with Acts chapter 21. So I'm just going to turn to Acts 21. Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's taking aid to um, help the poor Christian Jews in Jerusalem. And um, he reports of what God has done among the Gentiles and everybody rejoices. The apostles, the leaders, the elders were all rejoicing and they glorify God. Now, if we go to verse 20, it says, and when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So firstly, just pausing there, when we look at what Paul does and the message he's trying to um, portray, he's portraying it not to unsaved Jews. He's portraying it to saved Jews. These are thousands of Jews who have believed. They're born again. And it says, and they are all zealous for the law. So these are Jewish believers in the body of Christ who have on their heart the desire to keep mosaic customs and injunctions. So no one's telling them to do it. The apostles didn't tell Jews you have to be Torah observant. It was in their hearts. They were zealous for the law. And in verse 21, it says, and they have been told about you, Paul, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. The word forsake there is the word apostatize, apostasian, which is to do with defection, as in the great falling away. It's not falling away from Jesus here, it's falling away from Moses, falling away from the law. They, they hear that you're telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Who's being told this? Who's hearing this? It's saved Jews, not unsaved Jews. And so here it says in verse 22, what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. So these four men belong to the company of the apostles. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there's nothing to the things that they've been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. So Paul is doing this not to be a witness to unsaved Jews so they can get saved. As he says to the Jew, I became a Jew to the Gentile, uh, to the one without law as without law, but not being without law. Um, this is not that context. This is the context of saved, born again Jews who are disturbed that they're hearing that Paul's telling Jewish people to stop living a Jewish lifestyle. And um, the apostles want to please these Christian Jews to show them that Paul's not teaching that. Paul himself is Torah observant. And so outside of the context of evangelism, that's what Paul does. Um, and they reiterate in verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, 
and from blood and from what strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, the next day purifying himself along with them, went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. And you can go to Numbers 6, verses 1 to 21, to look at that, that when you kept the Nazarite vow, when you fulfilled the vow, you did sin offerings. And then after when you shaved your hair, you offered peace offerings and you put the hair on the fire underneath the offering. So you could see the keratin and what was smoking from the hair would have flavored the meat. And so you've got this, this is the nearest thing you have in the Old Testament where God actually accepts human sacrifice because the person is offering on the fire an extension of their own body, which is ultimately pointing to Jesus. Jesus is the one who offered himself, not just his hair, but himself completely in, in the payment for our sin. So Paul is, for the benefit of saved Jews, he's showing he's Torah observant. He's enabling these people's to shave their heads and to offer peace offerings. They would have already offered sin offerings in the temple. Why did they do this? No one was forcing them to, they wanted to. They were doing it from freedom, not from compulsion. But because they were so persuaded and it was so much in their hearts, they, they were worried that Paul was teaching Jews to do this, to, to forsake Moses. Why is this important? Because, in the early church, you had these factions. You had Jews that felt like Gentiles had to keep the law, which some of them snuck into the Galatians. But you also had Gentiles who were free from the law. In fact, Rome was one of these places. If you go to Acts chapter 18 and verses 1 onwards, it says, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. Paul went there. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so suddenly you had this exodus of Jews outside of Rome, and the only people left in the church are Gentiles. Now, um, Aquila and Priscilla probably still had their business and their home there, and maybe left it under a steward, but they had to physically depart. And so the church becomes very much Gentile. When you look at the book of Romans, by this time, the Jews have come back, because if you look at the list of names that Paul asks them to greet, there's a quite a number of them who are Jews. Um, so they've come back, and it seems from Romans chapter 14, the Jews and the Gentiles are struggling to fellowship together, because unlike churches today, the early church actually met together to eat together on a Sunday evening. Um, so they would have had table fellowship. And Jews and Gentiles having table fellowship was a big problem for people who grew up in Judaism. They would not sit and eat with Gentiles because Jews had very strict regulations about how their food was to be prepared, what kind of um, food they were allowed to have, and Gentiles didn't have that. And so Paul is writing to the, these Roman believers to show their oneness in Messiah through establishing the foundation of the gospel, that we are saved by faith, not by works of the law. So if you go to Acts chapter 15, we see in verse, let's go from verse 5. Um, Paul and Barnabas, um, they, they were involved in great strife in Antioch because certain brethren were teaching that Gentiles have to convert to Judaism and keep Mosaic injunctions. And so they go to Jerusalem to settle the matter once and for all. And it says in, in verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed. So you've got people in the sect of the Pharisees who were followers of Jesus. and so. It says they stood up saying it's necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. So prior to this time, every believer was Torah observant. They kept the law. 
Um, and, and that's why this whole issue with the Gentiles became such a big issue, because even the Samaritans didn't fit into this category of uncircumcised Gentiles. And so Peter, in verse 7, after much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? We can't keep it. That's what he's saying. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So when Peter kept the law, he wasn't keeping it for salvation. He kept it because he was a Jew. Salvation is only by grace. And therefore, Gentiles can be accepted just as they are without becoming Jewish in identity and culture because we're saved by grace, not by works of the law. And that's what Romans is about from Romans chapter 1 to Romans 11 it's one continuous theological discourse explaining the, the gospel, answering Jewish objections to the fact that we're saved by grace, not by works of the law, and then also showing forth the implications of that. Well, you've got a lot of Jews who don't, don't believe in Jesus. They're very faithful to their religion. So uh, what happens to them? And um, we need certain presuppositions to understand why this is a, pro a problem. So let's turn to Romans 9 and um, we'll read the first five verses and then we'll look at some of those presuppositions before we progress on with the rest of the chapter. So Paul says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies me with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Because if salvation is by faith and not by works of the law, then Jews who reject the Messiah, Yeshua, they're not going to spend eternity with God in heaven. They're rejected. And that's why Paul is absolutely emotionally um, moved with grief, because he wants to see Israel saved. And he says in verse three, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And now the reason he's upset about them is not simply because he's a Jew and they're Jews and who wouldn't want to see people from their own nation saved. It's much deeper than that. It's not purely fleshly in terms of my family, my familial identity and, and the, the people that I come from. It's also theological because he says here, this is the reason why he could wish, like Moses did, that God would blot his name out of the book of life in order that they may be saved. Because, in verse 4, they are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons. And I've got a teaching, I actually did a teaching at um, Cornerstone on the adoption of sons. It's, it's, it's about our eternal inheritance being rulers, co-rulers with Christ. That's what the adoption of sons is. It's our coronation um, to, to, to be co-rulers with Christ. And so it says, to them belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants, plural, and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Notice it's present tense. It belongs to them and it belongs to them by, by right of birth. They are born the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore they are elect. They are chosen. It actually belongs to them. It was promised to them. And it says, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all? God bless forever. Amen. But it's not as though the word of the God had failed. So we need to understand two presuppositions here. The first presupposition is Everything that we have in Christ actually belongs to Israel. Hold your finger there and go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Um, Paul takes up a, an offering, which he took to Jerusalem for Acts 21. 
um, for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And he's going to collect some from the Romans on his way through. And it tells us in verse 27 about the saints in Macedonia and Achaia who, who were pleased to make a contribution. And it says, yes, they were pleased to do so. And they are indebted to them. Why? Why is there this debt? Because if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them in material things. So that's the first thing is we what we have in Christ has been graciously shared with us by saved Jews. That presupposes that God must save Jewish people, because if there's no Jewish people saved, there's no one to share with us their spiritual blessings. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, and it says in verse 17, if some, that's Romans 11 verse 17, if some of the branches which broken off, that's Jewish people broken off from their own covenant, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant. We've been grafted in among them. We've been made partakers with them, which presupposes that they are there first. Therefore, my salvation as a Gentile is in part due to God's faithfulness to Israel in maintaining a saved remnant. So that's the first thing. What we have in Christ belongs to them. The second thing is this, that God had promised to save everybody in Israel. And that's what Paul has to deal with now. So turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 verse, 30, verse 27 onwards. Sorry, verse 31 onwards. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 onwards. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, M meaning not of the same character. That covenant was made in stone. God wrote his law on tablets of stone. But according to Deuteronomy 29 verse 4, that covenant did nothing to change their heart. To this day, God is not giving you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. And then it says, this, this covenant which they broke, even though I was a husband to them. Verse 33 says, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not again teach each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. God has promised that one day all Israel will be saved. The problem that Paul's got to address is knowing this and very knowing what the scripture teaches about the new covenant. Paul's got to address how then can God make the gospel this, um, this means of salvation in such an extent that some Jews are actually cut off and thrown away when scripture says all Israel will come to know God. And that's what Paul's dealing with, and he deals with it in two ways. Romans 9, he's teaching that not everybody descended from Israel is Israel. But then in Romans 11, he teaches that eschatologically, the survivors of Israel, the, the, re the surviving remnant, the whole nation that is still alive, will become saved. And so it will be fulfilled literally but here it's fulfilled in terms of what Israel actually means. Israel is not just being a physical descendant. And so I used to be a Calvinist. When I read Romans 9, I read it in the idea of God looked at humanity and said, I'll have you, I'll have you, I'll have you. And then I don't want the rest of you and no hard feelings. It's got nothing to do with you. It just pleased me to save this person and not that person. And it's got nothing 
to do with anything good or bad that anyone's done. It's not to do with how you respond to the gospel. The reason people go to a lost eternity is fundamentally and primarily because God does not want them saved. And then now I've come to understand Romans very differently, that the context of Romans is not about this person, this person, this person. It's about two groups of Jews. God takes the one nation and he separates them into a twofold Israel. Israel according to the flesh and Israel who are born again. And we get grafted into this one, not into this one. These Jews are, are physically Jewish, but they're also nationally Jewish, but they're also spiritually Jewish. And we are grafted in here, but God will one day fulfill his purpose to Israel nationally. So if we go back to Romans 9, this is what Paul says in verse 6. It is not as though the word of God had failed, for they are not all Israel who were descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. So God makes a choice within the nation. He divides them into two. He, sorry, I'm trying to get my hands in the shot. He rejects the one who is born by first birth alone, and he accepts the one born by second birth birth the second born the reason paul is laying this out is to show that god rejects this one first that he may choose this one and that's why his example of election is isaac and then jacob isaac was born second jacob was born second Ishmael and Esau were both firstborn. They were to have the right by virtue of first birth, but God rejects them to give the blessing to the secondborn. Notice he doesn't talk about the election of Abraham. I've got a commentary by a guy called James Montgomery Boyce, who um, does a whole series of studies on the book of Romans. And I've got his um, volume on Romans 9 to 11. And he makes a very curious point here. He says that why does God not, why does Paul not write about the election of Abraham? Because if you want to talk about God electing people, he would be a, a good example because God just picked him out of the nations and um, made him the forefather of the Jews. And his answer to that question is that election would have been obvious in the case of Abraham. And that's why he doesn't even write about it. That doesn't make sense to me. Because for a Jew, election is just as obvious in the case of Isaac and Jacob. It's obvious in all three. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's not because of that. The reason Paul doesn't use Abraham as an example of election is because he wasn't the second born, born to after the first born, with the first born rejected so that he may be chosen. That's the reason why. And so... What you've got, the first example of election is the comparison between Ishmael and Isaac. Look at what it says. They're not all descendants just because they're Abraham's descendants. Because through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That's taken from Genesis 21 verse 12. So if we turn to that and hold our finger in um, Romans 9. And I hope I'm not, I sometimes have a tendency to speed um, and talk a bit too quickly. So I hope I'm not um, losing anybody or leaving anybody behind, but Acts 21, sorry, Genesis 21. And then let's read, um, actually Genesis 21 verse 12. Can we go from verse, Nine, Genesis 21, verse 9. Now Sarah son, saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be heir with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, 
your descendants shall be named. So notice this comparison, the one who is born first marks the one who is born second. And this is going to get exacerbated in the examples that Paul produces. The first one persecutes the second one. Secondly, the first, the one born first is kicked out of the house. So he's no longer part of that household. The one born second, he is the heir. He gets the inheritance. So what is this thing of choosing? What, what are we learning from this? When we go back to Romans 9, verse 8, Paul tells us, that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Because if you look at it, the one born first was born through the cleverness of Abraham listening to his wife, Sarah, to make a plan. Well, you know, I'll give you my maid. You can have a son through her. And you can fulfill through the strength of the flesh and the wisdom of the flesh. But the one born second is born by God's intervention. It's a miraculous birth. And that's why it says in verse 9, for this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. So because of God's intervention and God coming in, there is a birth. And that's the one who's chosen. So God rejects the one who trusts in the law and in their first birth and says, well, I'm a Jew, I'm chosen. God rejects them and he chooses the one who is born, born again. He has to reject the first in order to choose the second. So that's the first thing you see here is the nature of these two. The one persecutes the second and the first one is born of flesh. The second one is born of the spirit. Let's move on. The next example is with Jacob. Not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, they had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so I used to read this. It, to me, it was so clearly portraying Calvinism that it's got nothing to do with anything good or bad you've done. It just pleased God to choose this person and not that person. But Paul's not using this example in that way. He's not communicating that message. He's saying that God has chosen the one born again and he's rejected the one born Jewish. So it's two groups of Jews. And um, the second born is chosen because of spiritual birth not because of anything good or bad that they've done. So let's look at this. Firstly, it said the older will serve the younger. If you go back to um, Genesis chapter 25, Genesis 25, let's go to verse 23. What God does with the two individuals is not about ultimately the two individuals. It's actually about their descendants. And so when Rebecca is pregnant um, and God enables her to conceive, she has this, feels this wrestling inside of herself and she seeks the Lord about it. And God says to her in verse 23, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. So the older, again, is Israel according to the flesh. The younger is Israel born again. Jacob's the ultimate example. Jacob cannot be accepted as Jacob. He has to become Israel. And so it's not about good or bad. Whereas for the firstborn, it is. It's about, you know, keeping the law. In Judaism, there was a concept of what they called Hayetzel Hara and Hayetzel Hatov, the evil impulse and the good impulse. The evil impulse, they said, began at the first seminal drop, um, basically from conception. The good impulse begins when a Jew becomes bar mitzvah. 
at the age of 13 and they become a son of the commandment. The commandment comes and they suddenly are accountable to God. They say that the good impulse is younger than the evil impulse by 13 years and therefore the evil impulse is stronger. And, and so the idea is to, the more Torah, the more life. Through Torah, you strengthen the good impulse to overcome the evil one. Well, Paul tried that, but, um, and I think it was, and I'm not advocating C.S. Lewis's um, theology or his understanding of things, but he said this, and it was so true. Um, when people argue that um, surely you can be good enough to go to heaven, you know, that, you know, give me enough time and I'll be good enough. What he, sa he says about that is what they prove is that they haven't tried hard enough because if God is perfect and he is good, he must accept perfection if we were to merit heaven by our own works, which means that we have to try hard. But you've got to think every bad thought God sees, God hears every word that comes out of our mouth. He sees our hearts. And so therefore, God will require of us an accounting for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. And therefore, no one is good enough to merit um, merit salvation. Therefore, it has to be by grace. And so here, the younger is chosen in order that God's purpose, according to election, would stand. The first covenant is the slave master, the pedagogue, to lead to Christ. The old becomes a servant of the younger. And the old is all about good works. And that's what Paul deals with next. He actually continues in verse 14 and he says, what shall we say then? There's no injustice with God is there. Um, I, was, I watched an interview with, uh, a, I think it was Albert Muller. There was David Bruckner of Jews for Jesus. There was um, Rabbi Marvin here. And there was another rabbi from, um, I think, Yad, Lach, um, Yad Lachim from the UK. And they were discussing this whole thing of, is it okay for Jewish Christians to use Jewish symbols? Are they not deceiving Jews into tricking them to think they're Jewish when actually they're Christians? Because in their mind, if you become a Christian, you'll stop being a Jew, um, which is, for me, that's quite an offensive thing. But um, I kind of understand it because in, in Christianity, when I say Christianity, Christendom, um, Jews were told you either reject your Jewish background and culture and become Christian or, you know, you had the Inquisition that was about that. The, the, that premise that you can't be Christian and Jewish was actually um, thrust upon Jewish people by people who spoke in the name of Jesus. So what, what happened in this conversation was this rabbi, I think it was Mar Marvin here, it might have been the other one, but they, the big thing that they struggled with was this. They said, are you saying to me that somebody who murders somebody, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, so it might not be exactly what they said, but it's the same sentiment. Are you telling me that someone who murders someone and lives a just awful life can accept Jesus and they'll go to heaven, but then you've got a Jewish person who's kept Torah and they've lived a good moral life, but they're going to hell because they don't accept Jesus. It seems unjust to them. And that's what he's dealing. It's got nothing to do with good or bad anyone's done. Well, that means the most moral person on the face of the planet outside of Christ is going to a lost eternity. And God's going to punish them for their sin. But the Christian goes off scot-free. There's no injustice with God, is there? And not just that, but if you look at the verse before, and it's often misquoted, it's not just the fact that um, is any lost person going to a lost eternity. This is a Jewish person who God has given them the law and the promise of the blessings of the law if they were able to keep it. And then he's given them blessings and they're going to lose that inheritance. Look at what it says. It says, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I hated. That's taken from Malachi chapter 1 verse 2. Because, you know, you read that and you think, well, God's got a group of people and he just hates them. He hates them so much. He just stands, sits there hating away. But it's not meaning it 
in that sense, God's displeasure and wrath is on them, definitely. But the hating here is is as as practical a thing as God's love. God's love was manifested in that he sent his son to die for people's sin on the cross. It was a love manifested in action. Here, the hate is also manifested in action. Malachi 1 verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? And God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. So you've got the situation where love means this. Israel, you're back in the land. I've restored you. You have your inheritance. Hatred is, I take away your inheritance. Why was the inheritance taken away? Not just because it pleased God to decide, well, I'm going to take away Esau's inheritance and give Jacob his. But according to Obadiah, it was in payment for what Esau did to Jacob in helping Babylon to destroy God's people, Israel. So therefore, it's not arbitrary. God just decides. It's always relational. God responds to people. And so my understanding of that verse has changed since I've understood this understanding of the relational um, nature of God's election. It's not choosing particular individuals. It's choosing the group of born again Jews into which we are included if we accept the gospel. Therefore, God chooses the group. And in, in relation to the group, therefore, I am chosen. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. The, the, the election is in Christ and we are elect as we are in him. So Paul could go from being a firstborn Jew to becoming a secondborn Jew. Interestingly, Ishmael mocked Isaac. Esau wanted to kill Isaac. I'm sorry, kill Jacob. So you go from mocking to the intention to kill. And therefore, God will repay the firstborn at the right time, will bring manifest his wrath at the right time at the end. And so he bears with patience with these firstborn Jews. Why? Well, firstly, aside from Romans 9, it's outside of the context, but, you know, God is desiring people to come from firstborn to secondborn. Paul was one of them. He was a persecutor of the church of God. Was he exempt from God's election? The only thing that would have exempted him was his failure to repent and accept the gospel. And so God brings him in. But there comes a time when, you know, God, God gives people what they want and he hardens them. And so let's move on. Romans 9 verse 14 says this. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Sorry, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That's taken from Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. There, um, Moses prayed. Lord, I pray you show me your glory. And God says he'll take him to a, a cleft in a rock and he will make all his goodness pass by Moses. And he says, and I will be merciful to whom I'll be merciful and I will show compassion on whom I show compassion. And I will cover you with my hand and my glory. You will see my back, but you will not see my face because no one can see me and live. What does this mean? It means this. It has to be by grace. It can't be related to good or bad that we do, it has to be on the basis of faith in Christ because nobody can stand before God and claim that they deserve to be saved. No one can see God and live. We are sinful. We've all blown it, even Moses. And therefore, the only reason that you can see even the back of God, God's glory, is because of God's mercy and his compassion. And therefore, if the person rejects the gospel, they seal themselves to God's wrath. And therefore, God will, um, should they keep refusing, God will strengthen them in the choice that they make. Um, and he will harden them. And it actually goes into the next person. 
The next person doesn't show the contrast between firstborn and secondborn. The next person is an example of what happens to the firstborn. He's of the same character, and the character is Pharaoh. Pharaoh is of the same character as the firstborn. Why? Because not only does he mock, not only does he intend to kill, but he even goes further and he um, commits genocide, or at least tries to commit genocide. He kills many of the Jewish baby boys. He persecutes the people of God. It just gets worse and worse and worse, which is the, the kind of picture that you see with what Israel will be in the end days, which Jesus says when a, uh, an unclean spirit goes out of the man and goes through the watery, um, waterless places, seeking rest and does not find it. And he says, I'll go back to the house which I came from, and he finds it swept, cleaned, but unoccupied, no Holy Spirit there. He's, he goes and gets seven other spirits worse than himself, and they come back, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. So it will be with this evil and wicked generation. So what Israel was like in Jesus' first coming is going to be worse amongst the unsaved Jews who refuse to accept the gospel. It will be even worse in the end it'll be seven times worse and so the two prophets the two um, witnesses are going to be slain and their bodies going to lie in the streets of jerusalem and everyone is going to celebrate and party zechariah says god will cut off two thirds of israel and he'll bring one third and purify them with fire and bring them to salvation so this is what we're dealing with pharaoh is very much in that category and it says in verse 16, it's not about the man who wills or runs, but it's about God who has mercy. Because scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. And people use this to say, you see, some people just never will be safe because God doesn't want them safe, because God just hardens whom he wants to harden. But this Calvinistic idea of um, election says that the first premise of its belief is what's called total depravity or total inability. The idea is being born in sin, dead in sin, means dead as a doornail, and you cannot even respond to God if God so, um, you know, if God speaks to you. You can't respond unless God saves you first and makes you born again so that you can believe. But if that's the case and it's impossible for a person to respond to the Lord, then why does God harden people? There must be some ability to respond in order to God to harden. And why does God harden? Let's go to Gen let's go to Exodus. Why does God harden people who can't respond anyway? Well, obviously, to some extent, they must be able to respond. So if we go to Genesis, sorry, Exodus chapter 3, and God speaks to Moses and commissions him to go to Pharaoh. Verse 19, God gives a prediction based on his knowledge. And the God says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. God says, I know he's not going to do it. It doesn't mean that God's going to make him do that. He just knows Pharaoh will just not respond and harden his heart. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. So because of that failure to respond, the deadline is cut off and then we go into judgment. And so in the time of judgment, God's deciding he's going to make lots of plagues, not just one, but lots of them. And under compulsion, he will make Pharaoh um, let Israel go. So any response that Pharaoh makes is not repentance. It is simply to save his skin because of the last judgment was harsh. And so he might have been inclined to let the people go at certain times. But God actually hardens his heart. Why does God harden his heart? If you go to um, Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Not that he does them, 
but that he multiplies them so that they become exceedingly worse. Because the ultimate thing that God's going to do and the ultimate judgment because of Pharaoh's hardening is actually the killing of Pharaoh's children. Go back to Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21. Exodus 4 verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And that sounds like, well, God's going to harden him. But look, carry on. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So by the 10th plague, God has predicted that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. So the, for the first four, I think it's the first four plagues, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Then for the last five or six, God starts to harden his heart with the exception of maybe one time or two times when Pharaoh does it himself. But God does it so that he multiplies it to drag out the judgment and make it even more terrible. Why would God do that? Because if you go to Exodus chapter 9, Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. And this is what Paul quotes, by the way. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. For this reason, I've raised you up here. It's for this reason I've made you remain. In other words, I've kept you alive and I've kept you in this place of hardening, even though my judgment, I should have killed the, your firstborn the first time you rejected me, and the first time that you rejected my plea to let my people go, I should have brought the judgment then, but instead I've allowed you to remain this whole time in order that my name might be proclaimed among the Gentiles. So when the Israelites go in, Rahab says, we know what your God did in drying up the Red Sea. With um, the Gibeonites who come pretending to be a people from far off and they to make a covenant with Israel, they say, we've heard what God did in Egypt and what he did to the Roman, uh, the Egyptian army. And so God's hardening of Pharaoh was during a time when Pharaoh had already crossed the line where God had given him grace and into judgments. Let my people go. He hardened his heart. Therefore, judgments on the first plague comes. God is then through compulsion. He makes Pharaoh um, cause the children of Israel to leave, but hardens them again for final judgment. So what you've got is the firstborn. God held out his hands. It says later in Romans, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient people. Um, but there will come a time when judgment will come and God will, in a sense, harden them for that time. And so this is what it says in verse 19 of Romans chapter 9. So God has mercy on whom he desires. Who does he have mercy to? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pharaoh wasn't that. His repentance wasn't true repentance like Ahab in the Old Testament. Ahab repented, but it wasn't a true repentance. He still died in rebellion towards God. And so here we have God showing mercy to whom he desires, to the humble. He hardens those who reject his gospel and keep in that way of rejection. And so it says in verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he find fault for who resists his will? God hardened Pharaoh the person, the objections coming through that, well, obviously it must be God. And Paul rejects that. Verse 20, he says, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? He's saying the opposite. He's saying, no, it is possible to reject, to resist the Holy Spirit. You're doing it right now. You're talking back to God. That's from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9. Um, it's an allusion to that. But obviously, people do re resist the Holy Spirit. If you turn to Acts chapter um, chapter seven, Acts chapter seven and verse fifty-one, 
And this is Stephen preaching to Israel. Acts 7 verse 51. And he says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. In fact, the term on the contrary in the Greek is the same phrase that the Lord uses, the same word that the Lord uses in Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. When Jesus was preaching, the Lord was preaching, the, one of the women in the crowd raised a voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. It's almost like a women's lip type thing, um, elevating the mother of Jesus. And in verse 28 of Luke 11, Jesus says, on the contrary, same word, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. He's contradicting what's been said, not um, in terms of just saying you're wrong, but saying, but rather look at this. And so that's what he's saying. Look at yourself. Look at what you're doing. You're speaking back to God. Obviously, you're resisting God because when the Holy Spirit comes, he, he convicts the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. God is not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He'd rather have them repent. And so what God does, one nation, he's the best one, the firstborn he keeps for wrath. And the secondborn he brings to the inheritance. And this is what he does in verse 21. Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and one for common use? And this is an allusion back to Jeremiah 18. And this, when I cross-referenced this in 2001, to Jeremiah 18, this is what convinced me that my Calvinistic reading of this was off, was, was completely wrong. And I, in much confusion and in tears, rethink my understanding of salvation and God's way of, God's heart towards unsaved people and his ability to respond to um, prayer and to be moved by his people. Whereas while I was a Calvinist, for me, pray, my prayer life was a bit, bit like there was a washing line, which was God's will stretched out as, across the sky. And my prayers were like darts. And I was basically throwing darts at the inevitable. And if I could throw my darts in such a way that it hit that washing line, that's an answer prayer. But God was going to do it anyway. But Jeremiah 18, this is 1 to 10. God tells Jeremiah to go down to a potter's house and he's going to use the potter's house to teach him about what God, how God deals with nations and in particular the nation of Israel. And so he goes down to the potter's house in verse three and there the potter was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. God is still sovereign. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? So the clay represents the nation of Israel. And he says in verse seven, at one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down or to destroy it, to make it into a vessel of dishonor because the clay is spoiled in the hands. And so he says, if that nation, in verse 8, against which I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. Or at another moment concerning a kingdom that's, that I might speak, sorry, or at another moment um, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I promise to bless it. And so before, I used to believe God just decides. He'll make that person into a vessel of honor. It's got nothing to do with them. That person into a vessel of dishonor. It's got nothing to do with them. It just pleased them. Here, it's different. God's saying it's got everything to do with you, Israel. If you respond to my word, I will bring good things. I'll make you into a vessel of honor. 
And if you reject my word, I'm going to tear you down. You'll become a vessel of wrath. So in Jeremiah, the nation either has to repent and become a vessel of, of honor or they stay in rebellion and become a vessel of dishonor. It's up to them. But in Romans 9, Paul saying, no, it's not one or the other. Paul takes the one lump and he says, God makes it, he's able to make it into two vessels, a twofold Israel, a vessel for honor. These are the ones who accept the gospel and are born again and the ones for dishonor. Why are these vessels of dishonor? Because if you go to the end of Romans chapter 9, verse 30, it says, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? Some of them probably weren't even living moral lives, and they hear the gospel, they're convicted, and they're saved without becoming good and moral people first. What? Because it's by grace. But then... Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Not because God just arbitrarily decided, I don't want to save them, but they stumbled because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, firstborn. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written. That's why they're rejected. And so this party of the rejected persecutes the second born the book of hebrews is a classic example it's written to jewish believers who are part of judaism i mean they never left judaism some people think hebrews is telling jews don't go back to judaism well you can't go back to something you never left to begin with i mean an example of that is in the book of acts chapter 18 you had aquila and priscilla and it says in verse 24 of Acts 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So he didn't have the full gospel. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside. Where did they hear him? It says he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Aquila and Priscilla were still going to Jewish synagogue, but were born again, saved people in Christ, meeting with their Gentile brothers and Jewish brothers and sisters on a Sunday evening for fellowship, but still being part of the Jewish community. Hebrews is not written to Jews who are tempted to go back. It's written to Jews who are under persecution from other Jews who are telling them, if you don't reject Jesus, we'll kick you out of our synagogue. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, what we have in Christ is more superior to what Jews have under the law. We've got a better high priest, a better sacrifice. We've got better everything. So at the end of Hebrews, this is what he says. And it's so important to understand this because we need to put ourselves in the feet and the shoes of those people at that time, not in our time, where it's a gen Gentile dominant church. This was a Jewish dominant church. And so in Hebrews chapter um, 13, in verse 10, it says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. They want to exclude you from their table because you keeping your faith in Jesus but we actually have a table and altar that they don't have a right to eat from. And then it says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the camp. So let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. It's not saying don't go back. He's saying the opposite. Let's go out because it's far better to be rejected as part of a Judaistic society and keep your faith in Christ than to reject Christ to keep your place in the Jewish community. And that's what Hebrews is about. Jews didn't leave Judaism because they wanted to. 
they left it because they were faithful to Jesus and they were kicked out of the synagogues. They were rejected by the firstborn. It wasn't the secondborn rejecting the firstborn. It was the firstborn rejecting the secondborn. And so this is the thing. Salvation can only be by grace. God chooses the secondborn. And lastly, just to say, because it's on the basis of second birth and not on first birth, therefore the doorway is open for me as an uncircumcised Gentile to come in without being circumcised. Because look at what it says. Verse 23. Let's go from verse 22 of Romans 9. And we'll be finishing with these last points. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known? So he's willing to judge the firstborn. He's willing to, to do that. But what if he endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Notice destruction's not been prepared for them. They are fitted and prepared for destruction because if they persist in their unsaved ways and they reject the gospel they heap up wrath to themselves and they fit themselves for the for their future the only way out is through christ but why god shows patience to them the, the, there's no there's no well at this time there was no judgment on them they were the superior party the christians were the ones who were poor and rejected and maligned and mistreated and they seem to be getting away with it. But God shows patience to them. Why? He did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So you've got this idea that God's patience to them is showing his mercy to us. Why? Because if God shows patience to them in their unbelief and holds out his hands in case some of them might be saved, how much more patience will he show to us who respond to the Lord, who tremble at his word, who are repentant of our sin. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That God is always wanting us to succeed. And so even if we fail, we get up knowing God is on our side, but he wants us to repent. So his faithfulness to them, his patience to them, shows his mercy to us. And, and notice this is now going beyond a Jewish context. Because verse 24 says, even us whom he called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Me as a Gentile, I'm incorporated into a Jewish covenant. I've become part of a Jewish church with Jewish blessings and a Jewish inheritance. And I am included without having to become a Jew. Because it's down to a circumcision of the heart not a circumcision of the flesh. Um, and so that's what's on my heart to share, that as we read Galatians, we know that the context is Gentiles converting to Judaism. It's not about Jews not keeping the law anymore. Our responsibility as Gentiles to Jews is to, to allow them to live, be as Jewish as they feel that they need to be, to keep whatever they want to keep as long as they don't make it a basis of fellowship and division and a matter of salvation or sanctification, that I'm to accept the Jew as a Jew, but the Jews to accept me as a Gentile because the church and the body of Christ, the spiritual Israel that we've been incorporated into is this entity which is Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah that even though we're different ethnically, culturally, that as far as salvation goes and the inheritance that we have in Christ in the resurrection, there's actually no distinction whatsoever. We're not a second class citizen. And this teaches that we were aliens to the citizenship of Israel. The word politeia there is citizenship. It's used to speak of Paul being a citizen of Rome. We were aliens to that. We were far away, but now we've been brought near. We're treated as equal. The last thing I can say is, is um, that the example for, the, for, for this kind of scenario for me is the Zulu nation. I was a missionary amongst Zulu people. And in the, Zulu, the, the Zulus basically started as a tribe. There was a, 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 a person, a, a, tribe, a tribal chief who had two sons. One was called Zule, Zulu and one was called Kwabe. 
Kwabe hated Zulu and wanted to kill him. And the mother said to Zulu, go away and start a new nation. And so he, he started a new tribe, became the chief of a new tribe. And every Zulu king has been descended from him. So you got to a guy called Sinzanga Kona. And Sinzanga Kona had an illegitimate son called Shaka Zulu. And that's where you got the film Shaka Zulu. Um, it's based on him. And Shaka grew, basically grew up amongst the Zulu, but he was never really accepted. He was bullied. And then he ran away to another tribe called the Mtetu tribe, became the leader of their army. And then he went back after, I think after his dad died, and he took over the Zulu tribe and claimed himself as the son of Senzanga Kona, the rightful king of the Zulu. And the Zulu tribe then became a nation. It was Zulu and Mtetwa. And then they started to attack other tribes and incorporate those other tribes into the Zulu nation. So that when a Kamalo person from the Kamalo tribe and a Zulu person were going to court, both were treated as Zulus. They were both equal. However, the king of the Zulu will always be descended from Senzanga Kona, from the Zulu tribe, not from the Mtetwa tribe. The Butelezi tribe have their own king, but he's subordinate to the Zulu king. And so for us, we've been brought into the Commonwealth, the citizenship of Israel, on the spiritual side of their blessings, not the national. God's got a purpose for the nation as a nation, but we've been brought in, we're equal, but our king will always be a Jew. And the leaders and the apostles who found, had the foundation of the church laid the foundation. They will always be Jews. The Jews have primacy because of their first birth, and God still recognizes that. But in Christ, we have an equality, and the Lord um, brings us both in. And so we can partake with the same table, communion with each other, without having to cause the black person to become white in culture and the Jew to become a Gentile and the Gentile to become a Jew. God accepts us just as we are because salvation is by grace and not by works of the law. The law is good and great, and if I was Jewish, I would keep things from the, the Old Testament law. I would keep Shabbat. I would circumcise my kids. I would do that, but not for salvation or because I'm, I'd be Jewish, but I'm not Jewish. So for me, I'm to allow Jews to live the Jewish lifestyle that they desire. I'm not to tell the Jew how to live as a Jew. I'm just to give him the freedom to, to live, and he's to give me the freedom believer in Christ so that we may have harmony in the body of Christ. Let's pray and then I'll hand it over to Chris. Dear Father, I thank you for the wisdom of how you take two, pe two types of people, Jew and Gentile, that don't seem to, in scripture, to have been able to fit together nicely, but Lord, by your grace, you've taken us as a wild olive and grafted us into this this Jewish tree and we've been made partakers with Israel and their spiritual blessings. And you did it without having us becoming circumcised or keeping that culture as wonderful as that culture is. Lord, we just thank you so much that you accept us and, and you change us, Lord. And, and Lord, help us to repent from all the sinful things of, that our pagan nations still embrace and still practice today. Lord, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions, Lord, help us to walk in righteousness. But thank you, Lord, that we can stand up as equals, being Gentiles according to the flesh. We just pray this in the name of your Son, Messiah, our Messiah, Jesus. And I ask, Lord, that there's so much information that's been spoken today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that you would unveil our eyes to see the wonders of your word so that we may correct where we're wrong in our understanding and become more um, understanding and more